If you've got a Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're in Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20. I will read it, we'll pray, and then we'll get to work. Matthew 5, starting in verse 17, Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we're asking that as we open your word, that you by your spirit would speak. Help us to know how to think about the words of scripture and how they apply to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite courses that I ever took, I actually did not take for credit. When I first started my graduate program, it was a long time ago, so they had all of their distance education stuff posted on their website, and it was like a list of all the available courses that they had recorded the lectures, and then, you know, there's a digital copy of that and a workbook that goes along with it, and you could only do a certain amount of these. You had to do majority in person. And so I'm looking at this list of courses, and I'm such a nerd burger that I'm like, I cannot wait to take these things. And I'm kind of scheduling out, like, okay, I'm going to take this one, but I can only do one at a time, and I can only afford, you know, one at a time, so I'll do this one, and then I'll do my in-person thing, and then I'll take this one. And there was a course called The Christian, the Christian and the Old Testament by Dr. Walter Kaiser. And so that was one that I targeted, and I said, one day I'm going to take this, and I'm, I can't wait for it. And in fact, I couldn't wait for it. So much so that I went ahead and I bought the course material, and I downloaded it and all the textbooks that go along with it, and I interacted with that material, and I'm like, one day I'll actually register for this course and take it. Uh, but when the time came, and I was like, okay, it's go time, I'm going to take this course for credit now, uh, I reached out and they said, actually, we phased out that course. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I went to the director of the distance education thing. I said, hey, what do you think I could just do this course? You know, like you had it. It was something you guys offered. Is there any way? They said, no. So I was like, okay. I go to the dean and I say, what do you think about me taking this course that you once offered here? And the dean said, no. And uh, it said, you know, the, the accrediting agency, you have to do this, this, and this, and we're updating our material. I went to the accrediting agency for the institution and I reached out to the guy and I said, this course is amazing. They've offered it for so many years. They just updated their materials. They're phasing it out. Is there any way that I could get a special allowance here? And he goes, no. Uh, <laughs> so my favorite course, I never actually took, but it was a course by Dr. Walter Kaiser called The Christian and the Old Testament. And what he did in that course was he explained how the Bible I think talks about itself. And it was so refreshing and so encouraging to me that I just fell in love with that idea and fell in love with the way that he presented it. I even, I even went out of my way to go meet him because he has a hobby farm up in northern Wisconsin. So I just wanted to go and sit with him for a little bit. But th that idea of what is the role of the Old Testament in the lives of believers today? Such a significant question. Let me put it a little different. What is the relationship between a Christian and Old Testament scriptures? And that's what Jesus is addressing here today. Now, his audience is coming at it from a different angle because they grew up with the Old Testament scriptures. So they're thinking more along the lines of this thing that is so important to us, that's a part of our cultural identity, this thing that we have been trained in, this is a part of our educational system, this is something that we have been you know, over the course of our entire lives, we've been told this really does matter. And here you are, and you're, you're proclaiming this really radical message, is what, you are, is what you're doing a departure from that? 
Is what you're saying, does it have anything to do with the Old Testament scriptures? And Jesus, as he's teaching, he's anticipating that question. He's recognizing that that's a question in the minds of his hearers, and he wants to address it. So, so they're saying, we know the Old Testament scriptures. Do you have any reference to that? Now, we come at it from a different angle. In my opinion, I, I feel like we come at it like, like whiny kids. Like, you know, when you tell a kid to do a chore, do I have to? Like, and, and then you're like, yeah, you have to do this. I didn't make this mess. You know, we, and we do the same thing when it comes to the scriptures. We're, we're kind of asking it like this. Do we really have to read the Old Testament? Do we, I mean, that's not really our problem. That's not really our culture. That's not really our, our situation. But again, the question remains, what is the relationship between Christians and the Old Testament scriptures? Well, Jesus gives us four lessons here, so let's take them one at a time. First off, Jesus indicates that he came to fulfill those very scriptures. Look at verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So when he looks at the Old Testament, he's saying, I didn't, I didn't come onto the scene in order to just do away with those. I didn't come to destroy those. I didn't come to do something that would totally demolish those things. But in fact, I came to fulfill them. And there's a couple different ways in which he fulfills them. One of the ways in which he fulfills the Old Testament scriptures is in the sense that they are aiming in his direction. He fulfills them in the sense that they, are, they prophetically speak about him. So when you read the Old Testament, when you read Old Testament scriptures, what you find is a document that, that is anticipating Jesus Christ. He fulfills them in the sense that they are speaking forward and going, one day there's a Messiah, one day the Messiah will come, one day there's a descendant of Eve who will crush the head of the serpent, one day there's one who's coming. And all of the laws, the commands, the, the decrees, and all of the prophets, and all that they have to speak about, they're all aiming in that direction. And so Jesus comes to fulfill the law in that way. In fact, one time he was talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he puts it like this. This is John 5, verse 38. He's talking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he says, you study scripture diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. You're reading your Bibles, and, and that's commendable, and you're excited about your Bibles, and you're looking at your Bibles and studying them diligently because you believe that in those scriptures you're going to find eternal life. But you're missing the point, Jesus says. These are the very scriptures that testify, in his words, about me. These scriptures are meant to lead us to Christ. They are helping us to anticipate and expect him. And he fulfills scripture in that way. That when we read the Old Testament, there should be an anticipation of him. And he says, I've not come to abolish these things, but I'm the point for which they exist. Another way in which he fulfills them is he actually, literally, fulfills them. He does what is demanded of them in a way that no other person ever has. He, he satisfies the requirements of the law and the prophets. He fulfills the scriptures in that way. He, he is the one who is able to do everything that the law and the prophets demand. In fact, if you just glance over at his baptism event, you see this on, on display. In Matthew chapter 3, he goes out to John the Baptist at the River Jordan, and he says, hey dude, I, I'd like to get baptized today. And, and John says, wait a minute, I think the hierarchy's wrong here. I think what would be more appropriate is if you would baptize me. And Jesus is basically like, well boy, you're going to get your baptism one day, but today we're doing it this way. And in Matthew 3, verse 15 he says this, let it be so now, it is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. He says, I'm doing this because everything about my life is in fulfillment of what God requires. So he is willing to do everything that is necessary. He does not cut any single corner. He is the only one in which can be said he 
satisfies the demands that God has put in front of us in the law and the prophets. He fulfills all righteousness. We'll come back to that in a few minutes because that is very, very significant. But Jesus is saying here, I have come to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And when he's doing that, he is, he is not setting them aside entirely. He's not abolishing them. He's not destroying them. He is validating them. He's saying that these scriptures are significant and they remain that way permanently. Well, some of us might say, well, Cor, have you read the rest of the New Testament? Because there's a lot of places in the New Testament where it seems like the Old Testament scriptures do get set aside or there, there is an end to them. For instance, the writer to the Hebrews has a lot to say about the law or the Apostle Paul. When you look at the Apostle Paul, how does he think about the, the scriptures in the Old Testament? And didn't Paul say that, the, that Jesus came and that's the end of the law? In Matthew chapter 10, verse 4, he puts it like this. Christ is the end of the law so that there may, now, so, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So isn't it true that when Jesus showed up and when he fulfilled all that the law requires, that's the end, right? That's the end. Walter Kaiser, in his course, he says, well, that's a misunderstanding of how you use the word end. And he uses an illustration of a train. He says, what's the last item on a train? It's a caboose. And when, when Paul is saying, hey, that's the end of the law, a lot of times we hear that as, well, that's the caboose. So there it goes, it's gone, right? Like I was talking to my neighbor last night, and he said that there's a shop that they have to visit in Naperville that's right by the train tracks, but it costs their, their company a lot of money. Because when they're going to the shop, there's this building that's right on the other side of a train track, and they'll have to sit there and wait for the train to go by until they unload everything just right up the road. But it's just one cart at a time. So he says, I'll sit there for 45 minutes, then I'll see the caboose, see you later, I'm glad that thing's done, and drive into the parking lot and get the items that he needs in order to leave. And he said, one time, I spent 45 minutes waiting to get in there, got the items, went to leave, and another train was there. I had to wait another 45 minutes. So when he sees the caboose, he's really excited about it, right? That's the end. See you later. Kaiser says that's not what's meant there. It's not the end of the train. It's the end of the line. It's the destination. The, the end of the law is not that the law is just, we're done with that now. Jesus came, get rid of that sucker. It's, the, it's where the track is leading us. Jesus is fulfilling the scriptures because he is the very point of them. He is the one for which the scriptures testify. Well, secondly, he says that the scriptures have a permanent relevance about them. Look at verse 18. He says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He looks at the law and he says, this thing is in force. This thing remains. There is not a portion of it. There's not even like the smallest little item of the law that can disappear from it. And he's, he's speaking about the, the alphabet and the different things. So in our, in our language, we've got like the lowercase i and you put a dot on there, this itty bitty dot. And he goes, that itty bitty dot is not going anywhere. Like the law, every, every aspect of it, there's not, the, not even the smallest portion of it is going to go away. It's not going to disappear by any means from the law until everything is accomplished. So when we wake up and we're tempted to think, I wonder if the Old Testament is important for me today. Here, here's, the, here's the way that we can figure that out. You get up, you go to a window, and you look out there, and if you see earth, it's still in force, right? If, if the world is still spinning, if heaven and earth are still going on, Jesus is saying it is very much still important for us. It does not disappear. It has not faded. We do not set it aside. The law is still in force. So the law is important. The Old Testament is important for us. And it has this permanent feature about it. So even though Jesus has come to fulfill it, he maintains that it, it remains relevant in some sense. 
And you might say, well, okay, didn't he fulfill it though? Like, isn't everything accomplished? I mean, he literally was on the cross saying, it is accomplished, it is finished. So, core, maybe it is game over and we can set it aside now. But the truth is, not everything is accomplished. If you've read the Bible, you recognize there's a lot that is left unresolved right now. Yes, Jesus has come and it inaugurated his kingdom. And there's a lot of things that he immediately instituted that are beautiful and wonderful, but we're still awaiting his return. There are things that we long for that are not accomplished yet. The doing away of sin, the, the healing of all the brokenness, the taking of swords and beating them into plowshares so that a weapon of destruction can be used for harvesting. Those sorts of things are not accomplished. And so what do we do? We wake up, we go to a window, we look out there and we go, okay, earth is still here. The Bible still matters. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to fulfill the scriptures and they are permanently relevant for us. So the third thing that he says, the third point that he makes is he actually wants us to practice and teach them. He wants us to practice and teach them. Look with me at verse 19. He says, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He's saying the Bible the Old Testament scriptures, you do not want to be setting portions of it aside and going, this is, this is irrelevant. This isn't for me. I don't even pay attention to this. He says, those who do those sorts of things will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. But those who practice and teach them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I will concede, this is not an easy task. I mean, I'm not standing up here saying, you go to the Old Testament and it's just super plain and super easy for us to do. It is a task. We have to figure out what is relevant for us today in, a, in, in the sense of it's all relevant, but how do we apply it to our moment? And that I do think is challenging. For, let me give you one, one example of this. So in the Old Testament, you've got this whole section on diet and certain things that the Israelites can and can't eat. So Jesus comes along, he declares all food clean, and now it's game on. You, you can go have sushi today and not feel like your relationship with God is in jeopardy, right? So the diet changes, but let's not just set that entire section aside and go, well, we don't care about that anymore. That's no longer important. That's no longer significant for us. No, no, no. We have to figure out what is that there for, for us today? How does that apply for us today? Now, I've, I didn't think through this perfectly, but um, wh one of the things that we could say is they had, they had a feature in their, in their existence where they were continually reminded of their identity and, and their relationship to God. Every time they went grocery shopping, right? Every time they were locating food, they were thinking about their relationship with God. Every time they sat down to eat, they had this continual reminder of their identity as the people of God. So what would that look like for us today? What if we built in these habits where we, we were continually reminded of our identity in Christ? Where even the, the eating experience, where we sit around our tables, what if there were things that we were doing that would help us to think about the relationship that we have with God? Now again, that stuff is not easy, but I would say it is incredibly rewarding to learn how to read the Old Testament in a way that shows its application to us today. That is a privilege and a joy, and it is significant for us. And, and honestly, if we don't learn how to do this, we're missing out. We're missing out on an awful lot. Jesus is saying he wants us to practice and teach the Old Testament scriptures. In the early days of the, the church, there was a guy by the name of Marcion. And he was a wealthy individual and an influ influential individual. And he fell under the spell of some false teaching and began to kind of view the world in a dualistic way where he thought, you know, spiritual things are really good, but material things are bad. And he started to look at the Bible and he started to think, ooh, I don't really like, I don't like 
Yahweh. I don't like the God of the Old Testament. And he started to pit the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, against the Son, Jesus. And he began to say, look, they're not even the same. And so he just, he divorced the two. And he, he became so committed to this idea that he actually made uh, some suggestions for what should and shouldn't be Scripture. And he came up with his version of the Bible. And what he said is, the whole Old Testament off the table. That's garbage in his mind. He says, get rid of that. And the New Testament, well, really only 10 letters from the Apostle Paul are worthy of our consideration. And I like Luke, but there's a lot in Luke that's kind of Jewish and kind of points back to the Old Testament. So he edited that. So he ends up with 10 and a half books. And he says, this, this is the Bible. And he puts that forward and he says, this is what we ought to be paying attention to. Now, the early church rightly flagged that and said, no, 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 no. That is all messed up. That is wrong. And in fact, they took an official position on it and they condemned it. And they said, this teaching of Marcion is heresy. This is false. Tertullian, he wrote an entire document called Against Marcion. And what they were recognizing is what God has given us in his, in his word, there are 66 different documents. You, do, you don't subtract this thing down to 10 and a half. That, that would be an error. That would be a grave error. This is God's word for us. And the God of the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament, they are one and the same. And so if you begin to look at your Bible in that way, that is a grave error. Here's what Walter Kaiser said, though. And this really arrested my attention. He says, Marcion isn't walking around today. He lived a long, long time ago. But the spirit of Marcion is alive and well. There are so many people today who are functional Marcionites. Meaning people who look at the Bible and, and kind of have a distaste for the God of the Old Testament because they don't understand him. And they look at the Bible and they say, well, I don't have the courage to just rip this thing up and just take out the things that I like. But functionally speaking, functionally speaking, there's an awful lot of the Bible that I just don't even care about. I don't read that. I don't have an interest in it. And frankly, I'm I'm not going to spend a lot of time in there. I'm just going to spend time in these handful of documents toward the end that I like and appreciate. Well, friends, that is wrong. That's an error. That is what the early church described as heresy. We need to learn how to be Christians who can appreciate the entirety of scriptures. And actually, if we don't do this, we lose an awful lot. We lose ethical teaching. There's so much in the Old Testament that we need to really understand how God has made us and what justice really entails. There's so much about the Old Testament that we need for all kinds of different reasons. But but let me just put it like this. If you don't have the Old Testament, you, you won't appreciate the Lord and Savior as much as, as much as you should. So think about it like this. Uh, imagine if I said to, to you guys, hey, let's go on a trip. Let's go to Colorado. Let's climb some 14,000 foot peaks over there. And um, I said, we're going to go over there. And you, you actually have, you have a couple different options. One is, we can get up bright and early before the sun comes up. We're, we've packed for this. We've got all of our snacks, all of our supplies, all of the stuff that we'll need. We'll set out. We'll get to the trailhead. We'll, we'll hike up the mountain. And you have to do it in the morning so that you avoid getting caught in a storm or things like that. And so you just set out very early. You make your way up the mountain. You climb up you know, to the top of a 14,000-foot mountain. And you're going to stand there, and you're going to be overwhelmed by God's majesty. You're going to walk through literal clouds. It's a, it's a wild experience. I was able to do, to do it with the Clarks once before, and, and it's just insane. So you go up the mountain, and you'll stand there, and you'll just be in wonder and amazement at God's goodness and creation. So that's one option. You can climb. The second option is there is one peak where they built a road up to the top, and we could drive up there, and we could park in the parking lot, And then we could walk up a little trailhead and stand at the peak of that mountain. And again, you will be overwhelmed by God's goodness. You will stand at that peak. You will look out for miles and just be totally and utterly amazed. But here's my question. Let's say a couple of us pick differently. One person climbs up, another person rides up in their car. 
Who do you think is going to appreciate the mountain peak with a deeper fullness? The one who made the trek. The one who walked up with the switchbacks and all of the challenges, with the altitude, altitude sickness and you know, having to sit down and eat granola bars and having to take their time. The one who took that incredible effort to get to the peak the long way. And they're going to stand there and they're going to relish that moment. And they're going to remember it permanently. And, and both, both people will for sure be amazed, but one will be more amazed. That's how I think the Bible works. Yes, you can just skip to the end. And you can just go to the Gospels and you can go to the letters of the New Testament and you can go, I think I got a good sense here. I think I know what's going on. But if you actually take the trouble to make the trek, you will appreciate your Savior in a deeper and more profound way. You will begin to recognize what he has done for you in ways that are breathtaking and stunning. Here's another, another way to think about it. Why do we hate spoilers? Right? If you're wanting to watch a show, why do we try to avoid people who are going to spoil it for us? Imagine, you know, you haven't watched the Marvel movies and I tell you, hey, I could save you a lot of time. I can tell you a synopsis of what's going on and the conclusion of the Marvel movies. My wife might argue and say, yeah, you're not great at that. She'll fall asleep, wake up and go, what happened? And I, I'll try to explain a show. And she's like, you're really bad at this. But with, um, with the Marvel movies, I think I could do an okay job. I think I could tell you the gist of it, kind of get you up to speed and then say, and here's how it ends. And I think you'd be pretty excited about it. But you would reject that invitation, wouldn't you? You'd say, I don't want you to do that. I want to go on that journey. I, I want to be a part, I want to be drawn caught up in that story. And here's why. God made us for story. He made, we are a story-formed people. There's a reason why over 75% of the Bible is narrative. It's because God wants to communicate to us, not just by telling us, here's what you should do, here's what you shouldn't do, here's what you ought to believe. He tells a story. And when you go through that process of interacting with a story, it changes you. You, you don't even recognize that it's happening as it is happening, but that experience is significant. So when we come to the scriptures, we shouldn't just be thinking, what's the quickest way that I can get to the top? We should be thinking, how can I enjoy the experience with God in a way that will permanently change me for the better? The scriptures, Jesus wants us to practice and teach them. Personally, I'm committed to that. And I think if you've been around for a little bit, you notice that. We go to books like Numbers, right? And we spend uh, a season in an Old Testament book, and people are like, what are we going to do in Numbers? What, like, are you kidding me? Or we'll go, eventually, we'll be in Leviticus. We'll, we'll, be, in, we'll be in Ecclesiastes, a, a book that was written on a, on a Monday morning, right? A just depressing book of the Bible, but we'll, we'll be there and we'll spend time there because God has stuff for us. And, and we'll go back and forth between Old and New Testament books. But, but Lord willing, I would love to preach through almost the majority of Scripture if God would allow for it. And um, Jesus here is saying, this is a significant thing. Practice and teach these things. If you set them aside, you will be considered least in the kingdom of, of heaven. And I think it's unfortunate, but there are way, way too many Bible communicators who are really happy and really willing to set aside a lot of the scriptures. But Jesus says, I want you to practice and teach them. Well, fourth and finally, he expects that his followers will observe the Old Testament in a way that results in what he calls here a superior righteousness. And this is, a, this is the part where a lot of us, if we're reading the Sermon on the Mount, we just scratch our heads and we go, I don't get this, right? Like, I understand that he likes the Old Testament. But then we come to this incredible line here in verse 20, and he's saying that our righteousness will exceed that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Let's look at it. Verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Pharisees and teachers of the law, here's their hobby, observing the law. 
It's their passion. It's what they spend all of their time and energy and resources on. They're trying to figure out, how can I obey what God has said? And now Jesus is coming along looking at ordinary us, saying, you're actually going to do a better job than they are. And in fact, if you don't, so I want you to practice and teach these things so that you could be great in the kingdom of heaven, but unless your righteousness is better than theirs, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. And that just should take our breath away of, what on earth are you saying here, Lord? How on earth could we have a superior righteousness? Well, we have to put it all together, so let's do that quickly. Here's what Jesus is saying. Number one, I have come to fulfill the law. He's saying that in him, the law points to him and is satisfied in him. Then he says, but it remains permanently relevant. So I want you to practice and teach it. And when you, do, when you put all of that together, here's what you begin to recognize. What he's talking about is followers of his, we don't have to earn our righteousness. We don't have to go to the Bible and try to perform our righteousness. It's gifted to us. And that changes the way that we live, very practically and very seriously. Jesus is saying that there is a righteousness that we can obtain that he will give to us. That's the point that he's making here. It's not something that you're going to produce on your own. It's not something that you're going to be able to pull out of your hat. This is something that only he can give you. That's why the, the Apostle Paul in, in Romans, and I'm just going to share a couple of verses from there because I think he makes it so plain. When, when the Apostle Paul is thinking about these different things, he's able to say this. He says, in the gospel, this is the good news, and this is what Jesus is talking about here. Here's how we deal with the Bible. He says, in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. It's a righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 3, he makes it very, very plain for us when he says this. He says, now, apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Again, here's what they're doing. They're pointing in this direction. This is, what, this is what they're supposed to do. The law leads us to him. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So there is a righteousness that we can have, and it is his. It's a righteousness by faith. It's a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It's a righteousness that radically changes us. And we get this new category then. This is what the Apostle Paul will go on to talk about. He, he talks about this practical and functional obedience, but he calls it obedience of faith. We don't just say, hey, Jesus, thanks for gifting us with this awesome, amazing reality, so now we're just going to live however we want. No, no, no. If you've received this righteousness, you care very deeply about what he wants. And you actually go to the Bible not to try to prove that you're worthy of God's love, but because you've already received it, you just gladly obey what he has said. It changes the way in which we relate to the scriptures themselves because Jesus fulfills them for us, but he commands us to practice and teach them by faith. And that then changes the kind of people that we are. And we're able to say our righteousness, it goes down deep. It's not a surface thing. It's not superficial. It's sincere. We are a saved people, a redeemed people. So we go to the Bible and we try to listen to his voice and we actually want to obey him. We actually want to do what he says. We're motivated because of his love toward us and our appreciation for him. And we go to the Bible and we say, whatever it is that he demands from me, I'm happy to try. And the gospel will give me wings to do it. It'll help me to be the kind of person that God wants me to be. That's what Jesus is saying about the Old Testament. It's for us. It is for us. He has fulfilled it. It is permanently relevant. We ought to practice and teach it. And by doing so, by trusting in him by faith, we will have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, a righteousness by faith. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be changed by your word. Help us to believe that your word is significant, that you speaking to us is what we ultimately need. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Help us to believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for us. 
Help us to view our Bibles the way that the Lord speaks about it. And help us to be changed by Him. By placing our faith in Him and receiving His righteousness. And then being willing to consistently go back to the Bible to find out what would it actually look like to live this thing out. How could we obey Him? How could we serve Him more faithfully? So Lord, let us be a people committed to your will and your ways for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.